get to work together outside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, these things work. Uh, and we are gone by you always wanted this and it's happening yeah 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 mm. okay, okay let me just do this now Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, who have joined us on this Dr. Fundi Digital Health channel via multiple social media platforms, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and also the Dr. Fundi website. My name is Dr. Fundi Lenyati. I'm the host uh, on this channel. Today, it is the 9th of August, 2020, uh, National Women's Day in South Africa, a day that uh, is traced to the 9th of August in 1956. Uh, that's about uh, 64 years ago, when the South African Federation of Women, led by you know uh, leaders like Albertina Sisulu, they led more than 20,000 women uh, on a defiant march to the Pretoria Union buildings, um, where they were protesting against the past laws that were being extended to women by the apartheid regime of the prime minister of the day, J.G. Stradom. Uh, those women who were marching, they had a slogan that was directed at the prime minister that was saying, meaning you touch women, you touch a rock, you will die. Since then, uh, women in South Africa have been referred to as imbogoto or rocks, hence this series of interviews or conversations that is called um, Bogoto Conversations. 
um, these words of a uh, you know uh, what in Bafaz, what in Bogoto symbolizes the extraordinary courage and strength embodied in the 1956 women's march uh, against those past laws, but also the fortitude of South African females today. With the new South Africa uh, and the subsequent new uh, constitution in 1996, women's rights to equality are part of the Bill of Rights, uh, you know, of our constitution. However, in reality, uh, women still face enormous challenges, a um, lot of stumbling blocks at home, at work, in society, with a lot of discrimination, prejudice, gender-based violence, sometimes even femicide. So it is on this, you know, uh, recognizing all this, that today we have invited, uh, you know, one of the Mbogotos, uh, you know, Professor uh, Noza Jova, um, you know, as one of the women of South Africa who have been able to navigate the challenges, uh, you know, that women are facing in South Africa. Uh, Professor Noza Jova is the Dean of the School of Clinical Medicine and the head of dermatology department uh, at the UKZN, uh, that is University of KwaZulu-Natal, Deben, South Africa. She is the only female Dean amongst the nine medical school deans in South Africa. And she's one of the first African female dermatologists in South Africa. She has since trained and mentored more than 40 dermatologists, many of whom have started and are heading well-established uh, you know, uh, 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 practices, uh, successful, successful public uh, uh, skin clinics. She's internationally acclaimed dermatologist, well-recognized in South Africa, in the continent of Africa, and also beyond. And she specializes on focusing on ethnic skin and hair. She has received many accolades and awards. Um, she has recently been awarded a leadership award as the best dean leader in her college. She is a well-published, sorry, she's a well-published dermatologist with more than 85 scientific publications in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, she is an NRF-rated researcher with more than 15 chapters in international dermatology textbooks uh, and uh, two dermatology books, which depict and are relevant to the South Africans and the black skin. She's a member of numerous international you know, um, uh, bodies, uh, boards and societies, for example, Global Psoriasis Atlas, uh, an international eczema society, a skin of color society in the USA, African Hair and International Hair Groups. She's been invited as a guest speaker in more than 30 countries. She's a member of the prestigious American Dermatology Association and a recipient of the 2019 Maria Duren Award from the International Society of Dermatology. In 2019, she received numerous awards for her great leadership as the first African Dean at the School of Clinical Medicine in UK, UKZN. She represents Africa as an associate member in the board of the International League of Dermatology Society, the largest body of dermatology societies in the world. So uh, I present to you Professor Noza Lova. Uh, Prof Lova, welcome to the Dr. Pundi channel. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Nyati, for inviting me. Yeah. Um, you know, before we get to our discussion, I just want to, you know, share a, a short poem of about two minutes uh, as a way of just uh, welcoming you so that you can settle. All right. Um, it's a poem by uh, Maya Angelo. I hope it will work well. Um, Yeah, the Thank you. 
All right. Um, let me stop the video there. Um, okay. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for uh, listening. Um, so today, like I said, uh, our guest is uh, Professor uh, Nozadlova. And, uh, you know, we are very, very, very grateful for her to actually give us time uh, in her busy schedule to be able to converse with us and share her journey. Uh, her journey from where she grew up, um, you know, in the Eastern Cape. And so my first question to you, Professor Ngoza, uh, can I just call you Snow? Uh, <laughs> so that we can just have, a, you know, a less a formal type of engagement. So, um, Snow, you come from the Eastern Cape uh, in a village called Mcholo outside of King Williamstown. Uh, can you just tell us briefly um, your early days growing up in that environment, you know, what were the things that shaped the Professor Jova that we see today, both from a family perspective and also the community that you grew up in? Mm, thanks. Thanks a lot, Fundile, for that kind introduction. Uh, I'm humbled. Uh, I think my, uh, as I'm the last one at home, and my, my dad passed on from lung cancer when I was 10 years old. So I basically grew up with my mom and my siblings. Yeah. And being last born, I was more like the apple of the family's eye. Yeah. So I was a teacher and uh, I hear that my dad also, they were really passionate about education. Yeah. So uh, that I had no option. You know, I, it, I, it was a path that was paid for me that I had to follow suit after my siblings who had also yeah. pursued a tertiary a education. But I think my mom being a teacher and the emphasis on education had actually planted a seed in me. Uh, and my mom really and my sisters were the people who were very instrumental in my life. And uh, I think a combination of that, uh, you know, led to what, what I have achieved today. Yes. So uh, you mentioned that you are the last born in the family, no? Uh, so does that mean, you know, normally last borns, they tend to be quite spoiled. They get away with many things. Would you say as a young girl growing up, uh, in, in, in Mcholo, you were relatively spoiled? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not. Uh, my mom was very strict and my siblings were strict, but I just, the, the way I was raised, uh, I, I just preferred people who communicated with me. I wasn't happy with people who were harsh or more, yeah. uh, you know, punishing uh, in the way they approached discipline. So my elder sister, which is Cisco, and my mom were more like that. And I sort of tended to align myself uh, with them. Yeah. Okay. So the fact that you grew up with older siblings, uh, does that mean you also got to mature? you know, very, very, very early, you know, uh, ahead of your age mates as we are growing up? Yeah, I would think so. I would think that that uh, actually made a contribution. And I, I was told that I was very independent. So even though I was the last one, my yeah. sister comes uh, before me, is 10 years older than me, but yeah. she's the one who's always clinging and uh, hugging to my mom. But I was always like playing out there, independent, had my own mind. So yeah. That, that's, okay. that's what I'm told, yeah. All right. So before we leave that part, you know, uh, what are one or two values that you say were actually, you know, implanted, you know, in you in that family setting that you came from, especially from your mom, besides education? Sure. I think one thing that my mom used to emphasize is, uh, you know, being kind and gentle to uh, Snow? Uh, Snow? Your line is a, uh, your, your bandwidth is a bit challenged. Snow? 
okay uh we just need to be patient um and see okay. if no we yes. lost you. we lost you there a bit oh okay yeah yeah you, if you can just 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 recap uh on 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 on, on the values that your mom instilled in you yes so i would say as i mentioned is a uh, humility uh yeah. My mom used to say, you know, humble, 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 my child. It doesn't yeah. matter yeah. how much you have achieved or how pretty you are or what you think. You must yeah. always be. So that was the first one. The second one, second one was, is, uh, uh, you know, do not allow anyone to undermine you. Don't give anyone permission to undermine you. So uh, that, that sort of instilled a lot of confidence in myself to be able to navigate anything in life. And yeah. the third one is you know, not being selfish and try to make a difference to the people around you, wherever you are in life, make a positive yeah. difference. Lovely, lovely. Snow. So as you are growing up, did you actually want to be a medical doctor or you wanted to be something else and you changed later and wanted to be a medical doctor? Yeah, so I think uh, when I was at Inanda seminary, seminary, when I finished, I thought I wanted to be an optometrist. Yeah. I thought medicine was difficult. So <laughs> my mom and <laughs> my mom and brother said, no ways, because my brother had done medicine in uh, uh, Medunsa at that time, but he left when he was doing third year because he didn't like it. Yeah. So he went through to the corporate aspect of it. So I think he actually encouraged me and my family to do medicine. And when, I, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you small. Yes, I can hear you very well. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And I think also we had pets and animals and sheep and goats at home. So uh, I think when when I was young, many times the 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 sheep would lose. You know, the the the. I think one one time actually happened. The one of the cows was given birth, and then the mother died during that uh, 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 during that process. So yeah. I felt so heart so and every day I would go and feed this uh, calf you know yeah. feed all the time and my mother would always say you are so caring you're so compassionate you should be a doctor and she yeah. kept saying this and that planted a seed in me and I think that that all those things uh, uh, produced the, the person that I am yes 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 so so small um so when you at Inanda you then decided that you are going to do medicine Yes. And there was no doubt about that. You were very sure now, you know, at that point. Uh, because remember, Inanda was one of the top schools, top public, well, would I call it a private school? Uh, was it a private school or a public school, uh, Inanda Seminary? <laughs> yeah, no, it was one of the best schools for girls at that time because we couldn't yes. go to private schools. <laughs> yes, because I remember that, uh, you know, uh, our own school, St. John's from Tata, would compete with you guys in terms of how many students have been accepted to do first year medicine. And uh, you know, we used to feel so sore if Nanda had more people admitted compared to, you know, uh, St. John's College. <laughs> but uh, it was a healthy, okay. healthy, healthy competition. And so you were, at, you, you know, um, you were accepted to do medicine. Uh, how did you find, you know, the, 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 the undergraduate degree in medicine? Did it actually, uh, make you feel I'm on the right track, or was there a point where you felt mm, maybe I'll follow my brother uh, and and take a detour? <laughs> yeah, sure. No, I think it was uh, interesting, and I'm glad I went to medical school because that's where I met uh, my husband, uh, Doctor Temba Mabas. So had I not gone there, I don't think I would have met I met him. Yeah. Uh, medical school was exciting and interesting. I actually failed my first year in medical school. I failed uh, chemistry in first yeah. year, yeah. and uh, I had to spend the whole following year now doing chemistry when my classmates were doing second year. So I had to join this group of second years like you guys, and then we're all a family. But I mean, when I failed chemistry and I had to do chemistry the whole year, I said to myself, I will never ever fail again in yeah. any yeah. Yes. So that was a lesson for me and something like yes, well, I, I wanted to ask proud to share. Yes, I wanted to know, Ubuti, um, what lesson did it give you, 
you know, that, you know, uh, what do you attribute, um, you know, that failure to, was it because of Mr. Perry's who was quite mean, uh, <laughs> you know, because remember, he, he, he would tell us, you know, at the beginning of the year that uh, half of you are going to fail, you know, uh, <laughs> so what do you attribute the, the, that, that um, you know, uh, situation to? Yeah, I think, you know, I always try in my life not to blame anyone for my failures or mistakes. Yeah. So I, I would say, despite Mr. Paris being who he was, people pass. So I can't say it was Mr. Paris. I think yeah. for me, it was really the adjusting into university life, you know, trying to balance. And then I sort of slipped up and I couldn't strike that balance in my first year when there were lots of courses to concentrate on. There was fun. There were boys, there were girls. Yes, you mentioned that you 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 met you met with TT there you know during that year. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, I always uh, uh, say um, some of the best achievers in the world are people who have once failed before. You know, uh, and there's a saying that if you have never failed before, it means you've never tried something new. So there's uh -huh. actually positive in actually failing. But let's move on from that. It was then for the rest of the undergrad, you just cruised through medical school. Mm. Yeah, so I, I passed. And then I went to do my internship in PE, a living yes. hospital. And then I had, uh, well, my close friend, Dr. Madala, who is now the head of medicine at uh, SMU. So when she she was doing internship in Amtata and I was doing internship in, 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 in Livingston and Temba had joined me. So Temba said he wants to specialize in ophthalmology. Yeah. And I thought about specializing. I was just, you know, cruising, wondering what do I want to do. So when my friend, Dr. Madala said, you know, I'm not going to private practice. You know, I'm going back to KZN, to medical school. I'm going to specialize in medicine. Mm. And Temba said, you know, I want to do ophthalmology. I want to specialize. And I had not thought about anything. Mm. Then I'm like, oh, if Temba is specializing, my friend, what am I going to sit and do, you know? Yeah. So as I was in PE, uh, there was a skin clinic there that used to run once in every fortnight. And there was a gentleman, Dr. Klavinsky, who was in private practice, who'd come and run the skin clinic. There were yeah. so many patients, like 50 patients. And he had to just go to them like that. He couldn't even examine them. He just look look, look, and the patients were standing. And I was so touched by this. And I asked myself, gosh, there's a, there's a real shortage of dermatologists and what is happening? And that sort of sparked an interest in me to do dermatology. So yeah. we came to Durban with uh, Temba and then uh, I looked for a post in, in dermatology. It was very difficult that time because they were not taking Africans in these uh, specialties. So Dr. Madala came to Deben to do medicine and came to Deben and I worked at my courts, you know, you know, as a medical officer before I got the post in 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 um, in, 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 in high school year. Yeah. But even then, I went to I think it was Professor Y. K. C. that at that time was head of medicine because dermatology fell under uh, general medicine. And I said, the Prof, you have never trained an African here. I'm here and I'm looking for a post. I'm looking for a job in dermatology. That was courage. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Why do you see that those days? I mean, that's a guy that we were scared of, you know? And yeah, I, I know. So respect. Yes, I know. I don't know where I got the courage from. I think, again, the confidence that I had from my, my family. So I said, you have never trained an African and in this medical school in dermatology, and I'm here, and I'm preparing for my primaries, and I'd like a post. So... I think he spoke to, I think it was Dr. Bales at that time. And then, you know, he, she was just about to retire and Prof. Baker was going to take over. And then I got the register post. Okay. So it was, it, it was relatively easy then for you, Moss. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I, had, I had been applying for the previous years or two, and I applied to Cape Town and Vets even then. And there was, you know, you couldn't get any post at that time. I even went to Cape Town, you know, at that time. Yeah. So dermatology, you chose it based on what you saw, uh, you know, um, you know, after you were assisting or whatever at the clinic uh, in Livingston. Um, it was not because uh, uh, you didn't want calls, uh, you know, uh, you know, waking up at night and uh, going to do uh, some 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 emergency work. No.
uh, Noza. Okay, um, we seem to have another little challenge, but we will continue uh, with our conversation with uh, Professor Lover, because we are still just building up uh, on how she got to dermatology. Uh, you know, she was just telling us how she forced the hand of the head of uh, internal medicine, Professor YK Sidat, those days, uh, under, under whom, uh, you know, this uh, discipline of uh, dermatology, you know, fell. And uh, she was able to get the post as a registrar. Now, a registrar is somebody who is uh, studying to become a specialist. So Professor Lover, uh, at the time she was Dr. Lover, she was accepted. Uh, how many, Snow? Dr. Dover? Okay, uh, so at the time, uh, she was telling us that uh, it was very difficult to get into dermatology. Uh, and there was no black African who had been trained in dermatology, uh, you know, those days, and uh, there were only one or two positions. Snow, are you back? Prof. Loza. Prof. Lover. Hi, Fundila. I think I lost you. I'm trying to move oh, to another. Okay. No, that's fine. That's fine. We, we, we'll, we'll wait for you. Sometimes oh. Wi-Fi, you know, it tends to create situations. Uh, you find that within the same house, sometimes, you know, the signal in one part of the house isn't as strong uh, as another part of the house. So, um, but I'm just, you know, sharing with the viewers that uh, those days um, you were saying the the University of Natal had not trained uh, a black African in dermatology, but also the number of registrars that were taken to train to be specialists in dermatology. Uh, it was one or two people, you know, at a, at a point. So uh, you went in, uh, you trained under Professor Abu Baker. No? All right, uh, let's just uh, give her a bit of time for her to settle. Um, for some reason, the bandwidth uh, in her house seems to be unstable. We get good, you know, uh, coverage, and then we get moments where the strength of the, you know, Wi-Fi isn't what we, 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 we would like to have. Uh, but uh, we can see that she's trying to settle down. Let's just uh, be patient with her because we still have a lot, uh, you know, of info that she needs to share with us. So let's just uh, be patient with her. Um, all right, no, are you settled now? Yeah, I've just moved to another area in the house. How is that? Is that now that one is perfect. That's it's perfect. Okay. We can just settle down. Okay, my apologies. No, no problems. No, no problems. Okay, yes, I'm, I'm good. Okay, all right. So you were still telling us that um, you managed to get the registrar post, uh, you know, uh, after you had spoken to Professor YK Sidat, who spoke to Dr. Bales, you know, uh, who was about to retire, and Dr. Abu Baker was actually the one who was taking over. So um, how many years, uh, you know, does one take uh, to, you know, train to become a specialist in dermatology. So you were committing to how many years? That, that was four years, uh, uh, Fundile, four years, yeah. And so, so um, how many of you as registrars, you know, at that time within that department? Sure, there were just, just my two of us actually, because there were only two posts at that time at UKZ, and it was myself and the colleague who's in the UK now. Yeah. And, and then, uh, uh, yes, no, you can, you can, you can. Yeah, and, and, and two consultants, two consultants and two registrars. Yes. And so um, you went in, how was your first year of, uh, you know, being a registrar? You know, did you find that actually this is what I want? And uh, obviously you have to write the, the, the exams as well. Uh, the primaries, did you write them during that time? Uh, first year or you know just just take us through give us a 
a sense of what happened in that four years? Sure. So um, when I joined, I worked as a medical officer in medicine. And whilst I was doing that, I prepared for my part one. So I think, in fact, I think I was one of the first people to write a part one outside from the department. So I yeah. wrote my part one, which is basic sciences in dermatology, and I passed. And then I, you know, I joined the dermatology uh, uh, rotation and I finished my training. I completed my training within three years, actually, because I had the advantage of having done my part one before uh, preparing for it before I joined the department. And yeah. then I finished uh, my four year training. I passed my part two after three years and I then worked as a consultant, as a junior consultant in the department. Yes. I, I just want to share with people, yes, no, that uh, at that point when you were starting uh, to be a registrar, I was knocking on the doors uh, of Prof. Abu Beika, uh, wanting to be the one who replaces you when, when you have passed. <laughs> yes, I remember that, and we lost you. <laughs> yes, you know, uh, three, three. When you passed, they phoned me to say you've got the position, but by that yeah. time, I had already been corrupted by other ideas. And uh, so, you know, yeah, but anyway, uh, yeah. So you became a, a junior consultant uh, in dermatology. Yeah. Yeah. So I became a junior consultant in dermatology and then training other registrars. So my mission now when I was a consultant was really push for transformation uh, within the dermatology department. You know, mm. I think I always say that when we are first, when we are first in any discipline, uh, you have a social and political responsibility to groom and bring in more people. So that was my mission to ensure that now that I'm the first African, I am going to aggressively and intentionally transform the department and mm. make sure that we train other uh, African dermatologists and uh, uh, in, in the department. So that was not easy because I met with a lot of resistance, but uh, I would go out of my way and recruit and uh, you know contact people to come and do dermatology yeah. because mm. that would be given at that time is that no, there are no applicants, nobody applied, no Africans apply. But one, one of the things I was mentioning that once you have a role model anyway, young people look up to you and say, you know what, if you can, she looks like me, if she can do it, I can also do it. So that becomes passive role modeling. And I think to, I'm proud to say that I've trained more than, I'd say 35 African dermatologists, both from mm -hmm. South Africa, Lesotho and other uh, neighboring cities. Yes, no, no, let, let, let's, let's just go back. So, um, there were two positions by the time you you qualified. Did they yeah. increase the number of uh, you know uh, people that were you know in the intake of registrars, or how how did you uh, you know uh, get to train so many people within a short space of time? I mean, um, to have forty more than forty people trained and uh, about thirty five of those being uh, black Africans. How did you manage to do that? Yeah, so good point, because I finished in 1998, you know, I, I qualified as a dermatologist. So uh, we, we uh, Prof. Abu Baker and us in the consultants, I mean, the department tried to motivate for more registrar posts. And instead of restricting uh, dermatology access and uh, at King Edward Hospital is the main referral hospital, we then tried to spread our wings and made sure that we, uh, create dermatology clinics or rather develop in other neighboring hospitals. So for example, now we have a clinic at Prince Mshini Hospital, uh, Peter Maritzburg, Edendale and Grace, Welezane, Stenga, RK Khan, Eddington Hospital. So I think from two registrars and two consultants, we now have about a staff of about 20 of registrars and consultants. Mm. Okay. That's All how right. we increase the number. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So now that's 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 quite impressive. Uh, that's quite impressive. No, you know, over the, this period uh, since 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 you qualified, and so um, you were then growing within the department. You know, as a as a consultant. Just tell us a little bit about that. You know, the journey from there to being the head of department of dermatology. Yeah. 
I think, as I say, every stage of my life has just been happening by default. I never planned to specialize. I ended up specializing. And when I was a consultant, I never planned to head the department because I didn't like the administration part of it. But I found myself heading the department. Now that I'm a dean, I never thought I would even get there. But here I am being the dean of the medical school. So I, I, for me, it's, it has not been like, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm gunning for and planning for. I think it's just been natural evolution of events and people picking up or seeing certain aspects and then feel that, you know, this is the position that I should, I should go for. But having said that, to answer your question, I then, um, you know, got a number of scholarships to go abroad to Singapore, to St. John's and the US and spent uh, some time there experiencing dermatology outside South Africa. And I met quite a number of people who were mentors and uh, actually inspired me. There were challenges in the department in terms of you know, racism and uh, favoritism and all those things that we know we grew up with. But that did not uh, deter me. I just refused to play the victim mentality. And I decided whatever happens, I am just going to forge my way through and make sure that we transform the department and, and uh, we support, I support the young doctors and dermatologists who would like to uh, uh, also flourish in this, in the speciality. Yeah. So I then, you know, as I said, Dr. Matala was a friend of mine. We we're always planning academic things together. We decided, oh, you know what, let's do our PhDs. And then even then I never thought I would do a PhD. So, but I found a topic or subject which was close to my heart and realizing that there's there are not many black dermatologists and the focus even internationally and locally was on white skin more than black skin. So yeah, you know, we see problems and we understand them and we speak the language. So who better to understand and learn more about these things than us, you know, the, the Africans. So I worked on my PhD and uh, for three years in 2015, I got my PhD. And the reason why I delayed my PhD, I think that was also intentional because you know, some people would say, oh, by the time I'm 40, I want to have my PhD and this and that. I think one just tries to, 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 to plan your life according to your situation and not compete with other people, and just carve your own path. And one of the reasons for me for delaying to get my PhD was that I saw that it's very important for me to be the core person in terms of teaching the young registrars that mm -hmm. I was learning. And I had to focus on that. So I found that if I were to do my PhD, that would mean that I'm going to totally neglect them and uh, be, not be able to make sure that they pass their exams. So when I, I was able to produce quite a number of dermatologists and consultants who are senior and good, I said, now this is the time. Let me leave them to run the teaching and let me focus on my PhD. And I knew. So once I finish my PhD, then I want to see more of them doing their PhDs so that yeah. they can take over and become better and achieve more than I have achieved. Yes. So then got my PhD in 2015, uh, yes, on ethnic skin and hair. And I graduated and then I got the professorship and the head of department. All in right. them. Yes. Let's just go back a little bit more. You mentioned something in passing. You mentioned that you did experience uh, some issues around racism, uh, you know, within the, 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 the department. Was this dermatology or was it, uh, you know, um, medicine? Because remember you said uh, dermatology fell under, you know, a, a, a medicine, a internal medicine. It was both, I mean, one was in an environment that was not a student, friendly or African people friendly. So uh, uh, the, the, the challenges were within dermatology itself and within the institution itself. I mean, if I quote an example that I can remember as an anecdote, I remember I was applying for a post, I was applying for senior consultant, senior lecturer, you know? And uh, I had that year, I had, uh, I think about 15 publications or so, and I qualified actually. And when the report came back, came back, it mentioned that I was not promoted because I had not done any research. That hurt me so much because I had about 15 publications. The previous year, I had just won the best 
uh, the best um, uh, medical faculty award research, you know. And here, the person who was chairing the, the, the promotion application committee says, I have not done anything. I actually cried in my office. And one of my colleagues, um, Prof. Mosan, came to me and said, you know, Moza, you're so strong, your tenacity, I understand, and all of And she made me feel better. But I cannot forget that because it's very frustrating and very painful when you work so hard and then someone just dismisses. So to me, it was like, he didn't even read my portfolio, he didn't even read what was in, in, in my submission. So those are some of the things, you know, that one experience. But again, I refuse to play the victim mentality. I dealt with yeah. that and I moved on, yeah. How did you deal with it? Well, I decided this is the situation uh, that I find myself in. And uh, I actually took it up with the individual who was sharing the session because I wanted to know how did it happen that this particular person was promoted? We had actually less achieved less than I have done. And then the, 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 I took it to the dean actually at that time. And then they, she, he explained and apologized and said he had too many uh, 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 applications to go through and therefore he didn't have time. So I said, okay, you had too many applications to go through, but you chose mine not to spend time on. And the others, you were able to spend time such that they were promoted. Obviously, there was no response to that. But I yeah. felt that at least I addressed it. And the fact that I've addressed it, then at least something will be done about it. Yes. All right. So, um, uh, and, then, and then you managed to get the senior lecturer, you know, a position thereafter. Well, I didn't apply again, but when I applied, I just, I just ignored that. I said, you know, I know what I'm worth. The title does not mean anything to me. I will continue doing what I want to do. And I just moved on and I focused on my PhD. When I applied for promotion, I was actually promoted, you know, from double promotion. So I didn't have to go to the senior lecturer. It was lecturer to associate professor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So you got to be a professor, Snow. And, and, and uh, so when you got to that point, what was next for you then? What, what, what was your next, you know, uh, aspiration? You know, because obviously, you know, you achieve something, then you have to look forward and say, okay, uh, there's another, you know, uh, challenge to, to work towards. Sure, sure, yeah. So my next aspiration then was really to invest in my uh, department and my colleagues to create opportunities and platforms for them to succeed, to do PhDs, to do research, and also create, um, create sub-specialities within dermatology. So I was able to create opportunity, opportunities for some of my junior consultants to go to the US and to the UK to become pediatric dermatologists. I also established networks with Harvard Medical School where we had uh, together with Professor Schmaltz because you know, we had an, a program where they were teaching us dem surgery, something that is not within our curriculum. So yeah. I had right. national net, networks and developed the clinic and you know, trying to improve things and the, our service to the community. Mm. Okay, all right. And so this deanship story then, when did it, it, it come in? Because you were focused on developing the dermatology unit, uh, you know, spreading the wings, you know, throughout the world, ensuring that those networks benefit uh, your mentees or people that you had trained. And then how did the deanship uh, come, come, you know, uh, to, to be? Yeah, sure, interesting one. So the post, the deanship was vacant. The, the post itself, there was no dean at UKZN for about a year and a half. Uh, so I remember I was abroad attending a Congress with my husband. And then I, uh, Professor, I said, uh, 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 what's his name now? The DVC phoned me saying that, you know, uh, he need, I need to take up this post. I need to apply for the post because there's no one and he thinks um, I have what it takes to, you know, take the medical school to another level. Yeah. So I said to him, no, 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 that's not something that I've, aspired for. I like my clinical work. I like my dermatology and my research. I hate administration. And being a dean means a lot of administrative work. And that's not something that's close to my heart. 
Mm. So uh, he begged me and then I said, okay, I'll have to ask for permission from my family because taking this position means a lot and it's going to affect uh, my time with the family. So I have to get uh, their blessings. Yes. When I came back, then I, you know, spoke to them, everyone, and they said, no, go for it. You know, we need leadership, we need women and all of that. And then my colleagues also um, uh, from UKZN, in uh, so Prof. Semitruan, uh, Masigel, and others, they were really so putting a lot of pressure on me to take the, to go for the post. Yeah. And eventually they won and twisted my arm and I was able to take the post. But I was also happy that the lady, that the doctor that I worked closely with in dermatology, which is uh, Prof. Anissa Mosa, it was yeah. a good person. And I was happy to leave her to, you know, to act at, in dermatology department because she was very capable and very hardworking. In the yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so then you became a dean. No, now that's a, a hectic uh, responsibility because you are the head of the institution. Uh, like you say, there's clinical side of you, you know, our responsibilities, and there's now leadership and management side of, 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 um, of, of, of the job. Now, how easy or how difficult was it for you to actually transition uh, you know, into that leader of an institution now? Yeah, you know, it was difficult. I must say for the first week, uh, you know, I, I, I couldn't sleep because I was like, this is a mammoth task. I mean, the morale at the medical school was, you know, at minus. Uh, so many things were not working right. And uh, I was thinking, how am I going to navigate this, you know? But then, uh, so I would plan and think and wake up in, at night and just write some of the ideas I have. I remember her husband bought me some books on leadership and all of that, yeah. and uh, which I hardly got to read because I never found time to read them. Yeah. So uh, I then had to plan a strategy in terms of how we're going to uh, navigate the whole change and leadership. But, you know, I think uh, I, I had a wonderful, a supportive group at the medical school. I think people were really ready for change, for transformation and to do things uh, differently. Yeah, I think uh, this part about transformation was, it seems to be a common theme. You transformed the department uh, and now you were getting to be on, you know, at the top of the institution. And again, was that your main agenda then, you know, to say, once I'm, you know, uh, I'm in that job, I want to make sure that the transformation of that, you know, and what did it mean for you? What were the things that you were looking at, uh, you know, in terms of transforming? Well, obviously, transformation is broad. Oh, sure. So um, I think the fact that the university itself was on the drive to transform, you know, the, the medical school, of course, our, 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 within our college, it helped because I felt that mm, I've succeeded in transforming the dermatology department. I'm sure I can do the same thing on a bigger scale, on a larger scale. Just get people to see why transformation has to happen because the number of people who support transformation because it has to happen. And now, instead of dealing with one small little department, which is dermatology, I can actually impact this on the whole medical school. And for me, that was something that drove me, that became now an excitement in terms of, um, in terms of, of the deanship post. So uh, there uh, were a number of colleagues, uh, most of them actually were pro-transformation, but of course there were those who were resistant and they would say negative things and give me you know, negative labels, but that could not deter me. So and one of, of the things I would mention is that I think I, if there's one thing I love, you know, in my spaces is diversity because diversity, you know, brings a whole lot of different people with different ideas, different backgrounds, and the product becomes a real success. So it was not changing the whole medical school into, you know, African leadership. It was getting the right ingredients and the right number of people for the different portfolios. And I would mention the heads of, I know I, I spoke to a number of, of my other Indian colleagues and they were like, no, no, you know, we not, don't want to want to take this post because it's meant for an African. I said, no, there's no such thing. 
All we want here, we don't want out of the 27 disciplines to only have two HODs who are Africans. We want an equity within the 27 disciplines. And the people who are great here, who are pro-transformation, who are innovative, who are progressive, I want to keep them. Uh, mm -hmm. Is the way that I want to have, I'd like to lead a medical school mm -hmm. that only has Africans. I want each and every person to be represented. And one of the things I mentioned to them that whenever you choose an executive group or leadership group, two things you look at, gender diversity and ethnic diversity. Because if you have the right number of people in your leadership group, how are you going to know about the interests and the issues and the challenges of the other group? You need representation from all the groups that you have. Mm -hmm. So right now, uh, the HODs that are there and, and, and some, I mean, I know there were some HODs uh, uh, departments that didn't have HODs for about you know, six years. Some, some of the departments lost accreditation, but I was able to convince and get people from private practice to come in and take over headship. And they're doing an amazing job, you know, because there are people who want to see the change and they will see the light and they will support you. And this is what I would say. If you don't see the light and you don't want to change, please leave us in peace so that those of us who want to work together as a team and a family of diverse academics, let us do that for the future of our children. Now, Snow, you know, in the South African context, when people talk transformation, um, especially those who were privileged before, there's always a question mark about lowering of standards. Now, as you were driving this transformation agenda within the medical school, wasn't there, you know, uh, issues around, you know, the standards are going to drop or are dropping or stuff like that? Yes, I'm glad you raised that, Fundile, because it is a rhetoric that is always mentioned all the time that, oh, okay, now you're dropping the standards. And I promise you, one of the things, I think when I took over, uh, from first year MPCHB, we were taking about maybe 65% Africans. And then when I took over, we went up to about 76% or so. And then the rest would be a mixture of the other ethnic groups. And last year, uh, and, and our university focuses on really grooming and, and picking up palette, talent from uh, you know, uh, rural communities and developing uh, uh, surrounding areas. So these are kids who come from uh, high schools that are really disadvantaged. But I promise you the lowest percentage that we took from quintile one to two, which is the lower schools was 80%, 80% this year. Mm. Now I would say these figures to them and say, okay, now where are we dropping the standards? Because our intake in medical school first year, the lowest that we took from uh, underprivileged school was 80% in metric from metric results. Mm. So just ignore those things because people don't want to, you know, lose power. And if they feel they're not part of the decision, they will say all negative and toxic things. You just focus on what you need to do and mm. bring up those people that support your vision and leave those, they'll fall on their faces. So what is the number of, you know, of, of, of students that are taken in first year? Because during our time, it used to be 80 people. Yeah, it's about 230. 230. Yes. Okay. Uh, and, 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 and then you're saying 65% Black Africans and then the rest is, 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 is the other ethnic group. Yeah, well, it's supposed to be more than that. You know, we take about, I think this year we took about 76% Africans. Yeah. Because our figures according to the the, 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 the target uh, equity groups that apply nationally, according to the government, South African government. Yeah, but now there was a time where there was a lot of uh, unhappiness, you know, in the communities in and around Deben about, you know, um, that transformation agenda, you know, that was looking at taking majority almost, you know, over uh, two thirds being 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 people of uh, black African you know uh, 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 race. So um, did that not affect uh, your your leadership? The pressure mm -hmm. from outside. No, as I say, you know, I I ignore loud noises and I focus on the work that needs to be done. So yes. if if we know that this is the vision and the goal. 
and the criteria is above board, we stick to that. The loud noises will always be there. You just yeah. ignore them and work through that, yeah. Okay, so that's one of the things that you did in terms of transforming the university, you know, um, by trying to get the demographics to be sort of in line with the national picture. What other measurements, you know, can you just share with us in terms of your successes in transforming the, 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 the institution? Yeah, so at the registrar level, we, we've been also aggressively trying to change the landscape, ensuring that the registrars that we take are predominantly uh, African. Because what used to happen in the past, you'd find that there are very few African registrars in certain disciplines. And uh, I know in plastic surgery also, that was a, a challenge and a problem. And you'd find that sometimes they are Africans, but they're not from South Africa. Not that we have any problem with non-South African registrars, but some departments were using this as a front to say they have African representation, when in actual fact, these are not South African registrars. And the issue would be that, I don't know what I had, uh, that you know, uh, they don't apply. So, but we've got medical students that we can actually use as a pool to groom them and get them to come back and specialize by making sure that the environment is nurturing and supportive when they come back. Because you never come back to a medical school if you've had a traumatic and terrible experience. During the years that our students are training, we need to make sure that we embrace them, we nurture them, and we actually mentor them. And that's what we've actually tried to do right now. So in terms of heads of departments, of registrars rather, I would say 55% of our registrars are African. And that is something that is really amazing because we're coming from 30% of our registrars being African. So we yeah. grow in strength and we're getting better and better. And again, HODs, we've got a number of HODs who are African and female and they have PhDs. So uh, in that regard, also I'd say we're moving very uh, 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 towards a positive direction because I'd say maybe half of our HODs are actually African. Yeah, so um, because the issue, I, I understand at a certain point, you guys took a decision that for one to be an HOD, they must have a PhD. Uh, what yeah. was the thing around that? Because before people would be HODs without necessarily having you know, a PhD qualification that's relevant to the discipline. Yeah, I, I think it's important for an HOD to have a PhD because you have to supervise um, registrars who need to do their MED. You also need to nurture and encourage your junior consultants to do research. And because if you are an academic center, you must do research, you must publish, you know. So uh, if you don't have those qualifications and as an HOD, it becomes challenge and it's something that we have experienced uh, if you have uh, doctors who want to pursue research then there's no one to mentor them or supervise them yeah okay all right uh, just just uh, we're going to continue with our discussions now but i just want to call on the people who are viewing uh, this discussion across the many channels that um if you've got any question that you'd like to pose to professor Lova, whether it's about you know uh, uh, her clinical work, uh, or about leadership, or about anything that you think uh, you know is relevant to us, uh, you can please you know send us a question via the comment section of the uh, Facebook or comment section of the YouTube, or even a WhatsApp message uh, to the number 083-391-4444. Uh, Four one zero six. Now, there's one question, no, uh, Snow, that uh, came through, uh, and it came through from a friend of ours, uh, Dr. Povungana, uh, from uh, Port Elizabeth. His question is: um, You did your undergrad during the mm -hmm. 80s, um, and now um, we are in the, you know, uh, 2020. Um, has the curriculum you know, that uh, the, uh, the students go through, has it changed uh, to reflect, uh, you know, the present day needs or it's still the way things used to be done, you know, in the, in the 80s. So maybe we can just start with that question from Dr. Povungat. Okay, thank you, Funz. Nice to hear from you, Bob. Uh, yeah, no, it has changed. I mean, it, it definitely has to change. You remember also when you were 
in the 80s. That's when HIV came in and the people who qualified before then didn't know anything about HIV. So the cur curriculum is constantly being reviewed. And one of the things that we've included in the curriculum and some of the things that we want to include is uh, research within our uh, uh, the curriculum. So those students who want to pursue research can actually do so. And also finances so that uh, medical students get, I mean, when you are a GP, it's, that's a business. So if, you know, introducing this in their curriculum would be the right time to do it. And we're also talking about emotional intelligence, leadership, because most of the doctors end up being leaders, even if in your private practice, you're actually a leader in your private practice. So these are some soft skills that we want to introduce in our curriculum. Some of them we have introduced and others we are going to introduce because we, we are currently reviewing the, the, the curriculum. Yeah. And um, if there yeah. are any suggestions from, from colleagues, yeah. please feel free yeah. to let me know. Okay, I'm definitely very, very happy to hear about the fact that matters of finance are actually, you know, people are, are given introduction to accounting because indeed mm -hmm. a lot of people either as GPs or when they specialize and they go into private practice, they start businesses which are, you know, solo practices and you need to know the difference between an asset, a, a, you know, a, a balance sheet and an income statement and a, what is an asset and all of those kind of things. Yeah. Uh, because during our times, you know, uh, during our times, uh, you go, you, you know, into private practice, you know, uh, and uh, you've got so many people around you, you've got accountants, insurance people and everyone, they want a piece of what you are making. Uh, at the end of the day, when SARS comes and says, you know what, you've been under declaring or whatever, uh, those people will just say, well, uh, you know, we were not involved. We were just uh, working with what the doctor gave us. So what I'm trying to say is that the lack of knowledge about matters of business, uh, because there was no introduction into basic things like, you know, uh, uh, at least, you know, introduction into accounting actually worked, you know, uh, in a negative way. Uh, so it was good. But remember, during our times, uh, to even have an idea of going to private practice, it was like, uh, you know, uh, that's treason because people should mm. not really be thinking private practice. You guys were training people to work within the public health care system. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's a good point. Eh? Yeah, but anyway, um, so that was the first question, Sno, uh, from Dr. Povungana. Another question that came through, it came through from a lady uh, who is a hairstylist. Her question is, um, as hairstylists, they obviously deal with the hair and uh, sometimes some people, they come in there with scalps that are obviously sick, you know, diseased, uh, and uh, they actually don't know at what point should they actually be advising their clients that this problem, it can be sorted by a GP, but this one, it needs to go to a dermatologist. And there's also people that are called tri, what is it? Uh, psychologist. Psychologist. So can you just you know answer that uh, for me, uh, you know, for on behalf of the uh, the lady who's a hairstylist? Sure. Thanks, uh, uh, Funz. Yeah. So psychologist. Yeah. It's it's difficult. It's almost like um, if we're talking about nurses who have to pick up skin diseases and when do they refer to a dermatologist or a general practitioner? Yeah. So. Scalp conditions are there, eczema, septum, psoriasis, a whole lot of things. And I think if a, a hairstylist picks up any of those or any form of hair loss, they should refer to a, a dermatologist. I remember last year I actually did a study and we invited about 300 hairstylists in Deben and we taught them, you know, the common scalp conditions and common hair conditions that they should pick up because with hair, you need to diagnose it very early. Otherwise you get permanent uh, scarring, hair loss, if it's not treated promptly. So yeah. I would say any condition that is abnormal on the scalp, whether it's excessive scaling or itchiness or patches of hair loss, they should refer to a dermatologist mm -hmm. as soon as they pick that up and not to wait. Uh, I think that answers the first question. A trichologist, these are people who are trained a little more, I'd say more uh, than uh, they have more focus on hair. Some do a diploma 
uh, some do a one year uh, 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 workshop or something, and then they are taught about scalp conditions or hair conditions and sometimes how to treat them. Yeah. But they cannot prescribe medical uh, 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 medications. They mix things and they also, some of them help with cosmetic camouflage. You know, people who have actually lost their hair and they create wigs for them and create tattoos for them so that you don't, you can hide, you can camouflage the hair loss. But they do have a reasonable knowledge of hair and scalp. And however, they eventually have to refer to dermatologists, particularly those who have an interest in hair. Uh, if yep. they are stuck. Yep. All right. So, so your answer then is, if they pick up that the scalp is really, really, you know, affected, they should, you know, advise people to go and see a dermatologist. Sure. Yeah. All right. No. So last year was it, I'm not sure if it's last year or in 2018, you were in the news uh, because you discovered a gene uh, that predisposes women uh black african women to what you called uh, scaling sorry um, scarring uh, alopecia can you just tell us a little bit about that you know uh because it was the first time somebody could actually identify a gene that creates you know uh, that vulnerability for people who are from the black african you know uh, community yeah so uh, thanks uh, food so this condition is called central centri central because it occurs on the central scalp on the crown centrifugal because it spreads outwardly secatricial means scarring that is permanent hair loss and alopecia is hair loss yeah so the literature around that time it was always thought that this condition is due to uh, using uh, hot combs you know those combs people used to use to stretch their hair and also yeah. using Texas. So during my clinical uh, experience seeing patients, I picked up that, you know, there was a family that had the central hair loss and most people would just label it as uh, imbanda or common pattern hardness. Yeah. So I then discovered that, you know, actually uh, there is this family, the grandmother, the mother and the daughter was about 11 years who had natural hair had the same condition. So I started doing biopsies and collected a number of, I think I had about 20 families at that time. And we published that in one of the journals. And then I worked with colleagues from North Carolina in America and from Israel, a geneticist, uh, to try and identify you know, the gene, because we thought that if it's happening in families and in some of the families, none of them had used any chemical processing uh, yeah. Uh, uh, procedures. Yeah. So it must be something that is genetically there. So yeah, that was about that. And we, we, we were able to collaborate and identify um, the gene that people may be predisposed to this type of condition, which is very common amongst Africans and African-Americans. Yes. So now that you guys know uh, that you could look for that gene and, and you know, is there something that you guys are working on, on how maybe it can be modified or whatever? I'm, I'm just talking here, uh, you know, oh. not, not knowing, yeah. So now you know what causes it. Uh, are you guys looking at what can be done to either slow down the progression uh, of the problem or eliminate it, you know? I don't know. Yeah, no, no, that's a good point. We are actually doing further research to find out whether we can pick it up early. That is, if a patient comes with hair loss, is there a way of screening to see that the, the, the siblings or the offsprings are also prone to the condition so that you can prevent it? Because what we found is that those people who have the hair loss, if you actually look after your hair, you don't use chemical processing and uh, pulling your hair and weaves and all these uh, synthetic uh, hair extensions, you are able to maintain the hair and at least the progression can be aborted. So that's what we're currently working on, but I don't have any further details beyond yes, that. on that. Okay, there's another question that is coming from a colleague, no? Um, the question is from Dr. Mushiana. Uh, he says, I am a dermatologist in private sector. Uh, I've been fighting the system to get more posts in the public sector for dermatologists in Gauteng. 
having spoken to the level of the MEC, but still told there is no budget for dermatologists. What is your advice in solving this problem as more of the dermatologists are coming out of the system? So this is a colleague who is in Gauteng. Uh, you know, um, it seems that uh, dermatology as a discipline is not maybe a priority within the Gauteng uh, health space. Uh, yeah, Shem, I, I can understand the frustrations. It's, it's, it's very, very difficult because the, the dermatology is taken as one of those little subspecialties mm. that are not significant. And yet, I mean, the top five conditions that are seen by private practitioners, it's, it includes dermatology. I'll say she must persist and, you know, I'm happy to chat to, to her as well and advise in terms of what she can do. But we, you know, the government is struggling with funding and uh, it, it's really a challenge. I don't have much uh, to say, but perhaps I, I wouldn't mind uh, if she gives me a call and I can advise her. Okay. Now, what I will do is now I will uh, forward uh, that person's, uh, that, that colleague's number, uh, and then you guys can have your, your chat, you know, um, you know, outside of, uh, of, of the forum. Thank you very much. Now, whilst we're talking about hair loss, no, uh, I, 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 I don't have hair and it's been like this now, you know, I started losing my hair at the age of 25. By age 35, I, I had to be permanently, you know, on a, on a cheese cop. Now, I understand you guys have been doing some work. Um, you guys have been doing some work in terms of hair transplants and things like that. Can you just tell us, you know, are there any advances now around issues uh, relating to male pattern boldness? Yeah. And by the way, uh, they say we are high risk for COVID-19 as well. <laughs> yeah, I heard that. I saw that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, yes, we there are quite a lot of developments in terms of um, hair transplants. We've also gone for, for such uh, procedures in terms of learning how to do it. And uh, great success, you know, with males, with male uh, androgenic alopecia. Of course, it depends on how far uh, advanced your hair loss is because you must have enough donor area to take from, to transplant from there to the area with hair loss. So you need to be assessed and uh, then, then check whether you are the good candidate for, 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 for hair transplant. There's also yeah. a, a, a form of treatment called platelet-rich plasma, which yeah. we also use where we take blood from you, we centrifuge it, and then we try and inject the plasma, which is rich of uh, growth factors onto the areas of hair loss. And there's a number of studies that have shown that it, it does work and uh, you know, especially if it's the correct indication and the right stage of hair loss. Yeah. So for somebody like me who has been like this uh, for more than 20 years, uh, there's very little hope. <laughs> 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 uh, the landing strip has almost, you know, left me looking like the clerk. <laughs> <laughs> you look but nice. Anyway, there's another question now, um, from a, a colleague. Um, what advice would Prof give to registrars experiencing bullying and unfair treatment by senior staff during the registrar training? I think this is general, um, you know, about people who are being trained to become specialists. There seems to be an issue of bullying uh, by those who are their seniors, uh, you know, to an extent that some of them even drop, you know, uh, their plans to specialize. Uh, do you have any advice? Uh, because you seem to have also gone through stuff like that, but you actually, um, you know, decided that uh, no one is going to stand in your way. You will finish what you started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Pundil. I think that's a very important and relevant question from the, 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 the listener. It, it saddens me, actually. It makes me feel very sad to hear such complaints. And I must say, we had a similar situation here at KZN where registrars were bullied in some department. And had the registrars not informed us, we would not have been able to intervene. But I would say to the registrar, they mustn't be afraid of being victimized or being sidelined. They must report that because the institutions do not promote that kind of treatment for, for, for young colleagues. So if you keep quiet, you die alone. So you need to be bold enough 
to uh, approach your your head of department. If your head of department is not assisting, then take it to the deanship. If the dean doesn't uh, do anything about it, then you know I'm actually happy to listen to that myself because I'm the member of SACOM, South African Committee of Medical Deans. Okay, so even if somebody is not at UKZN, uh, you know, if 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 they have hit a brick wall, uh, they could ask for advice. You know, of uh, course, yeah, because. Yes, because I re I represent myself and the late uh, Professor Pepeta were the uh, representatives of uh, SACOM at the College of Medicine of South Africa. So we deal with registrar issues and, and problems. And I must say, we've had issues that we've been able to address. And most people uh, do understand that academic bullying is a no-no and it's not allowed and should not be tolerated. The problem is that some of the teachers that are there they come from, you know, the previous ruling of, you know, the, 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 the consultant or the professor can say as they like or disrespect the registrar. We want mutual respect from both sides, from the registrars and from the teachers. But we need to report this because if we don't report them, then nothing will ever change. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, there is also another question that has come in, Snow. Um, just, just hold on. Um, would Prof advise that the use of makeup contributes uh, to having bad facial skin if one never had a skin problem before using makeup? So this is really about acne. Uh, maybe one, one wants to understand, you know, a little bit about acne and the do's and don'ts, you know, uh, when okay. you're actually having a skin challenge. Sure. So makeup per se is not a problem, but if you use... If you have oily skin and you use makeup that's got oil base or oily, you're going to have pimples and a lot of blackheads, especially on this area, on the cheeks. So uh, you need to make sure that the makeup that you are using is water, water-based. And if you go to the cosmetic counters, ask for a makeup that's light and water-based. Because if it's oily, then it clogs the pores and you get the pimples and you get the blackheads and whiteheads. Yes, and, and uh, any advice around taking care of the skin, cleansing, toning, those kind of things that are supposed to be done, you know, regularly as part of, uh, you know, uh, I, I, by the way, I do, you know, uh, cleanse and tone and stuff like that, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's fine. We all have to look after ourselves. This is not a woman thing or what, you know, we must look after ourselves and be, you know, proud of our skin. So, yeah, I mean, it depends. If you can you can use a cleanser depends most people have got combined skin which is you know it's combined uh, t-zone and all of that and then other people have got dry skin some have oily skin so if you have oily skin you can use a toner because the toner tries to remove excess oil but if you have a, a, a combination or dry skin you should avoid things like toners and scrubs because they make your skin even more dry so if after washing your face with whatever cleanse or soap and your skin feels very taut and dry, you must know that whatever product you're using is making your skin dry. So there's a range of products in the market. I actually feel sorry for the consumers because you don't know what to choose. So yes. if, you, if, you just, if you know your skin type, as I say, the most common skin type is combination, then you buy products for combination skin or products for oily skin or products for dry skin. But general, just washing your face with a soap or cleanser and then moisturizing, and then using a sunscreen would should be the basic. Yes. Now, so moisturizer, uh, but it must be water based, you know. Uh, no, that's the makeup. If you no, get the makeup. Yeah, makeup. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, no, when you were doing your PhD, you actually specialized, uh, or maybe just tell us a little bit what was your your, your research for that PhD because I want to get to the solutions that you have since you know uh, introduced or are about to introduce as a result of uh, what you you know um, the insights uh, that you got when you're doing your study. Sure. So uh, my PhD mainly focused on ethnic skin and hair, you know, black skin and hair. And I also looked at uh, use of skin bleaching and the damage that it causes on, on in the individuals. Why women use this or men? What are the complications? What are the psychosocial issues related to that? And then another aspect was looking at natural products like plants and uh, 
uh, indigenous plants that are used for cosmetic use, as well as clays that are used in South Africa. And then also uh, looked at hair, what are the common hair conditions that we see? And of course, you know, the description of the, the gene that we also identified as part of CCCA. So yeah. those were um, areas that I focused on uh, in terms of my PhD. Yes, yeah, so uh, flowing from that, uh, I understand that there are some hair products that you have pioneered in developing to make sure that they meet the South African, uh, you know, conditions and the type of, you know, uh, climate we have and, 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 and the type of hair that most people have here. So can you just say a little bit about that? Because you did not just end at a research level. You went on to provide a solution that is informed by that. And you, you, there's a name for that. Just, just tell me about that. Yeah, so it's more like trans, translational research. So what, what I, I realized that, you know, most of the, from, the, from our data and the research we did that uh, women were not happy with the hair products that are available in the market, particularly Africans, because there was really a limited range. Either the products were too greasy or they were drying to the skin and the shampoos were mainly shampoos, you know, meant for Caucasian hair or Asian hair, which is drying to African hair. African hair is very dry and curly and fragile and it breaks easily. So we needed more uh, products that are, are, are enriching, they are moisturizing and hydrating to the hair. So I use that background of research and understanding of, of the chemicals and compounds and ingredients to develop uh, products that are suitable for, for our climate and also have the correct uh, uh, ratio of ingredients that will make sure that the hair feels soft and the hair is easy to manage because we can say people mustn't relax the hair, they mustn't do this, but we need to offer options in terms of creating products that are going to make it easy to, to, to manage uh, our hair on a daily basis. So hence, my PhD, you know, actually translated into using that knowledge to formulate products that we will be launching soon called Nuele. We're just busy with the manufacturing and production now, and I'm sure I'll be back here to talk about them when we launch yes, them. Definitely, definitely. I'll give you that platform, Snow. Uh, it's important that uh, we showcase, you know, our homegrown solutions uh, to the problems, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, people face, especially if you know, they are, you know, founded uh, from uh, the outcomes or the, you know, uh, of, of, of proper scientific research. Because what we don't want, you know, is stuff that people push at times and you find that it causes more harm than good. But let's move on from that. You know, in South Africa, you know, we've got what we call, uh, you know, people no normally talk about dark chocolate skin and yellow bones. Uh, and all of that, and uh, I'm sure you 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 are called the yellow boom, um, you know, <laughs> because of your lighter skin. Now there's a lot of um, you know debate out there, you know, because there's a lot of celebrities now who are artificially uh, becoming you know yellow boom, uh, using either you know bleaches or using you know things like glutathione can you just talk to us about uh, is it wise to actually try and uh, you know you are naturally given your dark skin as a you know a, whether you're a black african or even an indian person um, is it wise to actually want to change your skin to become lighter yeah, what, are the, what are the dangers of that Sure, sure. That's a broad topic, but I can touch on it briefly. So basically, from the study that we conducted, we looked at African and Indian women in Deben, yeah. and uh, we found that 30% <clears throat> of the women were using skin lightness, you know, bleaching creams. So we tried to find out why is it that the women were using these creams. And what we found was that 70% uh, of them used the creams for, you know, to treat sort of appropriate skin problems like pigmentation from acne or melasma or any of the marks that people get. And then 30% and of them use the products just because they felt if you lighter, you are more attractive and more 
beautiful. Uh, there was this myth, there's this myth that if you lighter in complexion or yellow bone, you're much more attractive and pretty and can attract men. So that's, that, that's, that was 30% uh, of the women that gave us that result, the, the, that, that response. So we want to say to the people, uh, you know, we need to embrace our natural skin color. In fact, I always say when I give talks that if I were to go to pick and pay or check us or Woolworths and choose a type of skin, I would choose the darkest of the skin because that's the skin that is resilient to the climate. It's got melanin with a natural SPF of about 15. If you have dark skin, you're actually pretty, you're beautiful. You age uh, uh, much uh, uh, slower than people who are light in skin. You don't get skin cancers. Because there's a number of cases in Senegal where women were using skin lightness and developed skin cancer on the face and neck. So my message is always embrace your natural skin and the best skin that you have is the one that you are born with. If you are light in complexion, embrace that. If you're dark in complexion or coconut or brown, embrace that type of skin. And there are lots of complications that we see right now. We continue to see patients with complications from the use of glutathione and from the use of skin bleaching creams. They get fungal infections, they get uh, uh, stretch marks that are permanent because now some of the women were using these creams all over the body, which is really, really shocking and, and disappointing. But what we found also was that out of the study, the court that we looked at, 90% of the women did not know about the side effects of these compounds. So I think it is our duty then as researchers and dermatologists to educate the consumers about the dangers of bleaching their skin, because most of them didn't know that. And uh, that's what we continue and try to do. And hence, we actually avail ourselves on these platforms so that we can talk about the side effects of skin bleaching. So skin bleaching is a no-no. It is, should not be done. It changes your skin color. You get stretch marks, you get thinning of the skin and easy bleeding, you get skin cancer, and you get permanent pigmentation of the face, which is called ochronosis. And some people call it shubaba in African language, but those conditions are irreversible and you can't do anything about them. So what we say to people, if you have a nice glow to your skin, that's what we can give that you give a nice glow, but you shouldn't try and change your skin color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Snow, uh, as you were talking about SPF 15 and all of that, just, you know, in summer, we are in Africa and, uh, you know, the summer sun here can be quite harsh. Now, you know, any advice around issues of, you know, uh, SPF 30 or 50 or, you know, is there a difference, you know, uh, a big advantage if you go for 50 as opposed to 30 and stuff like that? Yeah, sure. So as you say, you know, Africa is hot and uh, that is why most Africans actually are dark. Naturally, you have to because that's the melanin that protects you. So if you remove that melanin by using skin bleaching, you're actually exposing your skin to more harshness. So an, a, a, a person, average dark person has an average SPF of 15 naturally. That's your God-given SPF 15. Yeah. But lighter perhaps like myself and the and the Caucasians, then it's like, you know, your natural SPF is about one or two. So we do encourage people to use sunscreens. Anything above 30 is good, SPF. So SPF refers to UVB, which is ultraviolet B. There's also UVA. So you need to make sure when you buy your sunscreen that it is a broad spectrum sunscreen that covers against UVB, UVA, and UVC. But that will be written normally, and I mean, you, visible light. It will be written on the bottle, so you should look for those. But the problem is that some of these sunscreens are expensive, and most of our patients cannot afford them. So the other thing that is important is between 11 and 3 p.m., that's a dangerous time. So when you're walking around and your shadow is actually shorter than your, your height, you must know that you should be indoors, because that means the sun is very is strongest at that time. Where uh, uh, put on an umbrella and wear uh, long sleeve shirts and try not to go to the beach between 11 and 3 p.m. or even sun 10, because those are dangerous uh, at times. Mm. Okay, now Snow, back to your role. We're switching from clinical to your leadership thing. Now, you have been a dean for some time now. Uh, how many years, two years or three years? Uh, <laughs> two years, this is a, Two yeah. years, yeah. Now, you know, there's a saying that good leaders uh, actually create a pipeline 
of uh, up and coming leaders that can even replace them. Now, uh, in terms of uh, the, you know, is there a succession plan within UKZN, uh, you know, medical school where, you know, you've got, you know, maybe three or four people amongst the HODs that could step into the position, you know, should, uh, you know, a, a process uh, be announced at a certain point when you want to move on or maybe when your time is, is up. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, as you say, uh, creating uh, other leaders, those are some of the attributes of great leadership. So in my um, it, at UKZN, we're actually coming up with a strategic meeting where all the HODs have to identify succession uh, plan individuals so that we can start talent management and grooming them so that if I drop dead tomorrow, there's somebody to take over. So, uh, yeah. I am doing that. There are a number of people that I have identified and these people can then apply for the post. And this does not only apply for deanship, it also applies for the HODs, the professors, heads of departments. You know, in the past, what would happen is people get to retirement and when they retire, they're like, oh no, I'm requesting for extension because there's no one to take over. So my response to that is you actually have failed if you have not been able to groom someone for succession planning, because you're hoping that at, when you reach your retirement, they will extend your time so that you can continue. You've had your time, you know, let other younger people and other people take over where you have uh, left. Hmm. So that's a question. Definitely, we're working on that. Yes. Okay. Um, there is another question from a lady, Nomampo Koswa. How much progress have we made in our country, um, just, just hold on. How much progress have we made uh, in our country so far in the field of teledermatology? Is it worth looking into? Our rural communities have very little access to dermatology services, and I think it would offer a solution to this problem. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, no, that's a, actually a good question and relevant question. We've started teledermatology uh, here at KZN, and we had a concept that we call adopt a hospital. So all the consultants would know that a particular consultant is always, you know, uh, um, uh, checking uh, uh, in SMSs or even having a proper video conferencing meeting every fortnight with the surrounding, with the surrounding uh, hospitals. But even better now, there's a platform called TeleEcho which we are going to launch at a medical school at UKZN. And we are going to be reaching out to all our primary healthcare doctors. We will announce it. You can post it also because everyone is welcome. And this is actually a platform that was started in Mexico where uh, the, this doctor who started with a gastroenterologist was able to discuss cases and teach through the teleeco platform. And, they actually used the Zoom platform long before uh, COVID started. So they, were, they could actually get about 500 people accessing the platform. So yeah. that's something that I'm very excited about. And I have a committee that's working on that so that we can share knowledge, we can discuss cases and each and anyone is welcome to join and learn from that platform. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, Snow, you still have how many years uh, ahead, uh, you know, or your, 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 your term? you know is it renewable is it a once-off you know yeah so because i was twisted to get into this position i didn't want to take it but this is my third year mm -hmm. so actually was planning not to finish the five years but you know maybe do three years and get someone else to take over so that we can actually create more leaders and allow more people to take the positions because as i said you know when you become a head of department or a dean you need to know that your life is not yours and you become a servant leader. You're not there because of the glory of the job and the title. You are there to help the people succeed. So you use your success to create opportunities for the people that you need to succeed. So I think uh, for me, if I could do that in less than five years, then I'm happy to hand over the baton to the next person because it's not about the, it's not about the position. It's just about making a difference and creating opportunities for people. Hmm. Now, Snow, uh, when you lead, leading people or managing people, it's a headache, right? Uh, whether it's in corporate 
or even in you know academic institutions like yours or even in government now uh, you must have had some difficult situations you know as a leader uh, uh, you know things that really sometimes you question why did i accept this thing because i was here to serve but actually i think i'm, I'm just getting uh, too much uh, trouble uh, for having accepted this role you know what, what are the kind of things you know uh, that are more like curveballs uh, that uh, have come your way as a result of the position that you hold uh, you know uh, within your institution yeah thanks Wendele. good question so i think mainly it's resistance to change hmm. people don't want to change they are so used or so comfortable in the way they were doing things which most of the time is benefits them not the people that they lead so it's a selfish way of looking at at, 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 at problems so some will label you, some will find faults with you. But what, I all, what kept me strong of going is that, you know what, if 80% that you are leading, 80% of the people that you are leading feel that thumbs up, you are doing the right thing, forget about the 20%. They will fall off the wayside and move on with the people who see the good that you are doing. Because yeah. challenges. Yeah. Was all, will always be there, just like in families. You fight, there will be challenges, but you address them and you move on and leave the chronic moaners and, uh, and the chaff behind. Okay. No, thank you. Thank you, Snow. Um, there's another question here. Um, how do we then regulate the use of such products, uh, you know, which are heavily being given by some of our colleagues, uh, you know, uh, aesthetic doctors, uh, and also people manufacturing these harmful products of the skin. A lot of our patients consult elsewhere first. By the time they come to see dermatologists, the skin is so damaged. How do colleagues know when to refer? So I think, uh, yeah, I, I'm sure you got the, the gist of the question. No. Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult uh, problem because, I mean, we, we tried here at UKZ then, we even had the demonstration sometime three years ago and recruited people, we made pamphlets, information available. But uh, for me, I think because sometimes we cannot control our porous borders and sometimes we need a lot of reinforcement from our government and the police, which becomes challenging. I think the best way is for us to educate our consumers. And for that reason, we are working on a book that is going to be distributed to young people at high schools because the earlier we teach them about these, the better. And also teach our kids that, you know, we do teach them about confidence and being happy in their skin rather than trying to change their skin color. So yeah. to the previous uh, uh, question and, and the listener, it's very difficult, but I think we shouldn't give up. We should try and, 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 and educate uh, uh, our consumers because that's what we have control of. We have no control of what comes in and comes out and what the people are selling out there. There are unscrupulous colleagues and even pharmacists. Sometimes they sell topical corticosteroid creams without a prescription. Some colleagues are selling these creams in jars which are unlabeled. Patients just go to the receptionist and buy the cream. It's, it's a real problem, so it's going to take some time. Okay, all right, yeah. Now, Snow, I'm going to ask you another question relating to your leadership there uh, at, at, at UKZ. And remember, dermatology was a sub, you know, uh, specialty within a, a big department of internal medicine. Um, now, during our times, you know, uh, they used to be sort of like, departments that were very big, uh, that had a, a bigger say than other departments. Now you coming from a small department according to the hierarchy then, didn't that uh, give you challenges? You know, you tell people at surgery, you know, uh, which was a big department or even uh, medicine itself, uh, that was a, a big department those days, you know. So how easy was it for you coming from a, a discipline that is normally a small discipline uh, to actually get the people who come from those traditionally bigger departments to, to actually uh, listen to you and give you the respect you deserve. Yeah, 
I think, you know, people, you, you, you actually earn the respect from the way you conduct yourself and the way you deal with people. And I think for me, one of the most important things is communication and engaging with my team. I, or consulting with them, not imposing, always requesting, what are your needs? How can I help? And I found that very uh, useful. And also where I do not know, I admit that I do not know this and I find people who are who have strengths in that area to work closer with me where I fall short. So I think I was humbly, humbly enough to acknowledge that this area I'm not uh, conversant with, therefore so-and-so or Dr. Prof. So can you assist me with this regard? And that helps and then people buy into your vision and also you work together as a team. The important thing is to create a team with a common vision. Yes. Now, no, uh, being at the helm of such an institution, we are wrapping up, by the way. Uh, we are going towards wrapping up. Um, being at the helm of such an institution, um, there's also what we call university rankings, and there's the rankings of, of, of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the professors there in terms of their research outputs and, and everyone else. Now, there are people who will then, you know, uh, there will be ranking of, let's say, the medical school in terms of the outputs research-wise. Now, during your time, uh, you know, the three years that you've been there, would you say um, there is a noticeable increase in terms of research outputs by uh, the Nelson Mandela School of Medicine? Yes, yeah, I, I think so, Fundile. I mean, we are graduating PhDs, we are graduating uh, masters and, and MSI students. And uh, the other thing that we, as, as I said, we were able to appoint HODs who do not have PhDs, but the requirement was within five years of appointment, you must get the PhD. If people don't get their PhD within that time, then they'll have to step down. So, yep. and also creating a, a, an infrastructure to support uh, research, there's a number of individuals who are passionate about research and we allow those to head that aspect of research to support, have workshops and, and, and for, for, for postgrads and for heads of departments who actually need to do their PhD. So we're slowly getting there, progressing in all aspects of our core uh, principle and core values. Yes, yes, yes. All right, so um, what are your next key things that we are looking to to achieve, let's say, over the next two years? Mm. You know, priorities or things that you are in the middle of, you know, um, uh, implementing? Yeah, so I would like to create a, a platform where we make health accessible to our surrounding uh, areas and the hospitals and district hospitals that we serve. And that we've already started working on, uh, which is the tele-echo platform. Yeah. Uh, secondly, I would like to work on a consortium that is going to uh, create or generate income because the government and the universities are struggling. So we need to use our uh, expertise to generate income for the university. So we're looking at actually having a, a center where we do research, a, 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 a clinical trials, we pull them together, we create an infrastructure and a support system. And we can also maybe even create a public private partnership where some of our doctors in the public sector can work within this institute and be able to generate extra income to, you know, to, to supplement their government salary within, uh, uh, within the, uh, the, the time that they're allowed to work uh, uh, on. So those are the things that I'm, I'm, I'm looking at. And also I'm looking at uh, establishing a gym because I am very much acutely aware of the mental wellness of our doctors who are subjected to a lot of stress and uh, long hours. So that process is in the pipeline. We have actually been given permission to build a gym within the medical school where doctors and students and all of us can access the gym and uh, at nominal fee. So I'm very proud of that. The other part is uh, we have started a, a registrar support group. We have annual functions for registrars. We felt that registrars actually 
They are young people, they've got families, and nobody even acknowledges them when they pass that after four years of grueling. So every year we have a function for registrars where we acknowledge them, we give them certificates, and we have a gala dinner, which is supported by one of the private companies. Mm. We are working on a platform to support Intense. That's going to start in September, where we felt that, you know what, Intense uh, actually are employed by the Department of Health. But during the two years and the COMSERV that they are with us, there's so much that we can offer them because they are within the academic sector. So yes. we'll uh, create a mentorship program for them. So those who want to spend time in the specialties, wanting, getting to know what they would like to specialize in, or those who want to do research, we can then create that platform for them. So those are the things that are um, exciting. Yeah. Uh, yeah, on the yeah. pipeline. So, so when you said the consortium, so I look at something like the Vets Health Consortium, you know, Some, uh, yes, something, something like similar that. Yeah. like that, but a way yes. of actually trying to augment, you know, the the funds that uh, you know the university has to make sure that you guys can do more work on the research side. Absolutely, and also even for our medical students. I mean, seventy percent of our students come from previously disadvantaged backgrounds. So, I mean, this was quite uh, obvious during this lockdown because most of our students did not have laptops. Whereas if you go with students from maybe UCT or Stellenbosch, most of them already have laptops. So we had to provide all of those for them. So that was a great eye-opening experience for us. Yeah. And now we are facing NHI uh, by 2026. No. Now, obviously, when you are planning anything in the healthcare space, one has to always factor NHI. How do you think uh, as the institution it will, it will affect or impact, uh, you, you know, um, the way you guys do things? Yeah, I think we're open to uh, partnership with, op we're open to public-private partnership. So we have been engaging and discussing those issues. I think there's always a space for everything. It's just, you know, your attitude and how you want to make sure that you create a win-win kind of partnership and situation yes. for, for those people that you work with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Now on the home front, no, your son uh, with TT became a doctor, uh, you know, uh, qualified as a medical doctor from UCT. Uh, by the way, why did you send him to UCT and not, uh, you know, keep him there uh, at UKZ? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we, we said we're not going to go to the, the, the family personal front. But anyways, now that you've asked. No, 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 just, just, just that one. That's the only one. That's the only one. <laughs> No, yeah. actually, we he was taken in most of the medical schools, but he didn't want to come to UKZN because his mom was there. I'm sure you yeah. can understand that. So he wanted to be away from Deben, and, and you know, yeah. so that was the main reason. In fact, having him studying at UKZN would have benefited me because at least the tuition would have been free because I'm a staff member. <laughs> lovely, 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 lovely. So, all right, um, and so uh, to young people who want to be doctors or young doctors who aspire to be where you are, um, you know, what word of advice do you have as we're wrapping up now? Uh, I words think, of encouragement, really. Yeah, sure, sure. I think, you know, if you set your mind on anything in, in life, you will achieve it. So it's really about getting out of your comfort zone, Persistence, persistence, patience and patience, hard working, and also surrounding yourself with, uh, you know, positive people, you know, get good friends around you, get good vibes around you and, uh, and, and stay away from trouble and don't lose sight of what you want to achieve. Just keep dreaming it and keep dreaming and keep taking steps towards it. There's no easy come in life, even with medicine, you have to work hard. If you want to get into medical school, you obviously have to make sure you get good grades. Once you're in medical school, you want to work hard such that you finish your MBCHB. There will be challenges. Life without, without challenges is not life, but use those challenges to, you know, to your advantage, to learn from them. So, and, 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 and uh, just persist and persist, yeah. Okay. No, oh, that's 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 uh, that's very very good. No, uh, because I think young people sometimes they get discouraged. You know, once they get a you know experience a hiccup here or there, you know, they get discouraged. Um, COVID nineteen, how has it uh, affected you know the you know your programs uh, as the institution? 
Um, so we had to quickly adapt. You know, one of the other things I always say is adapt or die. Mm. You know, that's life. It's survival of the fittest. So if you don't adapt to your current situation, you want to fall on your face and be extinct. So we had to quickly switch over. For example, our first year to third years, they are doing uh, digital learning online. And then we've got our fourth years up to the sixth years uh, who are now on the platform. But most of the time they are, they are doing e-learning. But of course they have to, to, to be exposed to clinical cases and in the hospital. So we make sure we provide PPE for them and, and, and take them to the low risk areas in the hospital where they can st still see patients because medicine is about you know, bedside teaching and seeing patients. So yes. how we have uh, addressed that. And of course, most of us are working from home, but we support and shout out to all our clinicians who are working hard and uh, in the, you know, in the stem of, of the condition. Yeah. And I think we, we want to also have our uh, doctors specializing. We want you guys to come back and specialize and be leaders that you're capable of. We will support you. The environment is changing. It, I used to say the environment was freezing. Now it's actually the incubator is quite warm yeah. to ensure that eggs hatch and to become the best that you want to be. Thank you. Thank you very much, No, I was looking now on the Facebook page. Uh, you know, there's a lot of comments rather than questions. You know, people mm -hmm. who are happy, you know, Nobengu uh, a colleague, says, Ntinga, 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 Ndini. You know, Nandi Pakata, you know, uh, Mr. Perez was indeed mean. Uh, you know, and uh, she says that there were boombas. That's why uh, you had that uh, challenge in first year. Uh, <laughs> you know, but she's very proud of you for taking the mandate and uh, you know, um, actually implementing transformation. Unjongos, uh, nonjongo, mayapi. So proud of you, Professor Dover. You are doing great job. Keep up the good work. Noampondo uh, Poswa. Thank you, Prof Noza. My question. Uh, okay, you've already answered that. Prof Zingela. Uh, she says Womanda, you know, and Professor Salome uh, Masume, uh, she says go for another five years, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, Prof Monga Tiliza, uh, you know, um, he just is very happy, you know, um, there's clapping hands, and uh, basically the interview was actually good. Um, and uh, the hairstylist who had asked questions around scalp challenges uh, can't wait to hear about your launch of your new hair products uh, so mm -hmm. that uh, she can be amongst the first people to actually, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, advise her clients uh, to make use of those products. Um, our classmate, Mohele Piwandrovu, Dr. Ndrovu, uh, very, very happy. And uh, one of the guys who's doing a master's who credits you for having opened uh, the, the way for him at UKZN, Mani Mani Riziki. Uh, he is just inspired. Uh, he says, uh, I've been inspired by what Professor Noza has said. I'm proud of her, you know. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and, uh, you know, so basically everyone, um, another colleague, well, um, PhD colleague, um, uh, Ruth uh, from, uh, from, from uh, the Western Cape, she says, excellent discussion. Uh, and uh, Mohelepi again says, we applaud and love your work. Keep going. So, you no, know, it's been a, a discussion that has attracted people, you know, from across, from academics uh, to people from other fields. Uh, you've inspired a lot of people today. Uh, and uh, everyone is basically saying, keep going. You're doing a good job. Uh, yes, there will always be detractors here and there, but you know, keep on moving forward. Now, on a not so good note, as we are closing snow, on Friday, we had news that uh, we have lost uh, a gentle giant, uh, Professor Lungile Pepeta, who was about to, uh, you know, have his first intake of medical students uh, from NMU uh, University. Um, you know, just, uh, you know, anything around that that you would like to say, it's a sad moment for us in the medical fraternity. Yeah, no, you know, I was so uh, heartbroken 
because I worked very closely with Lungile, you know, as a dean. We used to share ideas. You know, what an energetic, uh, hardworking, he really gave it all to make sure that, you know, he gets that medical school going. And I remember even before uh, when he had the, the COVID early diagnosis, I had flu. Also, I phoned, I'm like, Lungile, what were the symptoms? Because I feel like I got this metallic taste and flu. By the time I called him, uh, he was on oxygen. But even though he was in hospital, he said, Noza, I have staccato speech. I can't talk to you, but SMS. And then he sent me a picture of himself with the oxygen mask. And I'm like, this guy, even on his bed, he's still responding to SMSs. So that's a kind of a giant that he, he just reminded me, you know, of Wongani. And his loss to me was almost equivalent to that. A, a really young rising star. Mungile had produced like six uh, cardio uh, pediatric cardiologists. And whilst a week ago, actually, he phoned me and said, Noza, I finished my PhD. I've just submitted my last paper. I'm like, how do you do all of this? You know, he's got a PhD. He's planning, working on the accreditation at Nelson Mandela, trying to get people to go and work there. Really amazing soul. But I want to say uh, to my colleagues and friends out there, you know, uh, we, we, it's, we, we work hard, we strive for success, but we also need to look after ourselves. Uh, you make time to, to take a break, make time to exercise, make time to connect with the people that are important to us and matter to us, people that make us feel good and make time for our families, for those who have families. Because, you know, sometimes you work so hard, you throw yourself, in your in your in your occupational work and when you're gone you're gone you know you people will you'll easily replace you but i'm glad that Ulungile, young as he was he had achieved so much and i hope he becomes an example to the younger and junior colleagues colleagues in the medical school he's really he really epitomized someone who gave it his all he gave it his all and what a wonderful man and may his soul rest in peace i will Definitely miss him. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Snow. I think uh, the words you've just, you know, uh, shared now um, actually are representative of what everybody is saying in the fraternity about uh, the loss of U U Prof Pepeta. So, uh, but uh, at this point, Snow, let me thank you. Uh, I've taken more than the time that I had asked for, um, but uh, you know, we. We've really enjoyed engaging with you. Um, you know, the, the comments from the people, they actually are testimony to the fact that, uh, you know, it's been an enjoyable conversation, an enlightening conversation, an empowering conversation, and inspirational, you know, conversation. So thank you, thank you, thank you. But I also want to thank uh, all the people who joined in uh, to listen to our conversation. And, um, you know, I, in preparation for this meeting, I asked one of my colleagues here at work uh, to just prepare a three minute uh, video. I hope it will play, but if it doesn't play, well, I tried. Uh, it's really a, a, you know, a way of just a tribute to uh, Uprof Peta, but I hope the, the, the sound will not give us trouble this time. But if it does, I'm sorry, I will have tried. So uh, thank you to everybody who joined us. I'm going to try and play that video and hopefully it will, you know, uh, play uh, the way we expect it, uh, you know, to, to, to play. All right. Um, just thank just you. hold on. Uh, right. I don't seem to have that. Okay, I think uh, there are problems with that video. I'm sorry about that, um, but uh, it was really a, 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 a video that is saying um, gone too soon. So we use the song of Michael Jackson, you know, gone too soon. Uh, and we put the pictures there and you and me know we've been in events where we took pictures with him uh, at the funeral of Prof Wongani uh, on the 3rd of August in 2018. We took a lot of pictures there. He even gave me, uh, you know, that uh, that hat 
to try it on. Uh, and, uh, you know, last year at the Health um, Awards, um, we also took pictures where you got to be awarded uh, and we took pictures with you, we were happy. Uh, and so when I heard about his passing, all I could remember, you know, besides, you know, our conversations in between is those pictures. So unfortunately, this video is not playing, but uh, he really left too soon. But then, you know, it's God's plan and uh, it's not for us to question why now. Uh, it's for us who are left behind to take the page on and actually move forward. So thank you, Smo. Thank you to all the viewers. Uh, may you continue to do the good work you're doing. Thanks for inviting me. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks, Smo. Bye.